if you're here to talk about S-based performance on virtualized systems, you're in the right place. <laughs> so before we get started, I just want to know, okay, how many of you are running S-based on physical boxes? Okay, how many of you are running S-based on virtualized boxes? And how many of you are about to get forced to run it on virtualized boxes whether you like it or not? R not that many, all right. Uh, that, that's okay, so that's good. Okay, how many of you like the performance of your virtualized box? <laughs> All right, that's, that's why you're here, good to know. All right, so today we're gonna go through introductions. Um, we're gonna talk about why IT took your server. Um, we're gonna talk about why performance sucks, which clearly, since I saw one hand go up when they said they liked their performance. Um, so we'll talk about why it's not very good. Um, and then we'll talk about how you fix it and we'll get into something called S-Bench, which I'll, I'll introduce a little bit later. Um, and then we'll show some, some pretty cool benchmarks that'll kind of show off the different ways that S-Base is impacted by things like a virtualized platform. Um, and, and I have QA on there, Q&A on there. If you guys have a question, I know you guys don't want to listen to me ramble on for the next 45 minutes, so please interrupt me. I do not want to just like talk the whole time. I would much rather hear from you guys. That would be far more interesting. So about me, I'm Brian Marshall. Um, I am a VP of delivery at US Analytics. I, I've been in the IT field for about 20 years. I've been in the EPM space for about 15 years. Um, been on probably 150, close to 200 projects now. Um, I've presented at Kaleidoscope a lot since 2010, um, and I, I blog now. Uh, I actually recently renamed my blog from HyperionEPM.com, which was very difficult to Google for, as I understand it. Um, and I renamed it to EPM Marshall, which is a terrible play on words that even if you misspell, it will still work. Um, about US Analytics, my company. So I've worked there for 15 years, so I've been there for a long time. Um, we've, we've grown for pretty much all of those years while I've been around. Um, we've got a lot of clients. We do pretty much soup to nuts all, all the way around. If you need managed services, if you need implementations, infrastructure, hosting, you name it, we got it. Another slide about US Analytics that I won't bore you with. Um, so IT took my S-Base server. Why did they do that? Um, so Real quick, what are some reasons why SBS might take our IT server without looking at the slide? Anybody? Lower cost. Lower cost, that's right. So it is way cheaper to have virtualized servers because they're more power efficient and they're, they're more efficient in the way that they use resources in general. Um, so if we look at, at, at a physical server, physical servers are always on. They're, they, they have various hardware con considerations around support. So I might have a server that's from HP and a server that's from IBM and a server that's from Dell. And I might have three different configurations of all of those. IT doesn't want to support all that. IT wants to support one system, one series of boxes, and one set of devices that they can easily fix if they go, if they go bad. Um, physical servers are also naturally inefficient. So they are always on, whether we're using them or not. You know, virtual servers, while are, are they are also always on, I can do a lot more compression of a lot of systems into one system by just going virtual because all of our systems are not doing things all of the time. So we can start to combine those things together. Um, I, another reason that they might want you to go virtual is backups. You know, backing up a physical system is actually more difficult than you would think. And then restoring it is even more difficult than that. Um, in a virtualized environment, backup and restore is actually really, really easy. Um, you have snapshots if you want to do a patch and test it and not blow everything away. Um, and then from a backup and restore perspective, it's very simple for them to, to restore something from a backup. I do it often on my own virtualized platform. It's so easy compared to a physical box. Um, and then high availability. And, and this is a reason you guys might be interested in. If you look at high availability, uh, availability in the Hyperion space, you might need seven or eight servers to really pull that off right. A couple of HFM servers, a couple of planning servers, a couple of S-based servers. Okay, we're at six servers and we've just barely started. Plus the database side of things. So now we're at eight servers. Okay, well, what if I could just do that with three servers? Because naturally, in a virtualized environment, if, the, if your IT is doing it right, it's high availability. If one fails, another one pick up, picks up where it left off. So, so that's one of the really big benefits for, for us is it makes life a lot simpler for us because high availability on, on, on S-based planning and HFM, more complexity, more points for it to fail, more things to go wrong. And we like simple, simple works. So, and if you're at this point and, and IT's making you go, go virtual, there's a good chance your servers are probably old anyway. So they might be five or six years old, they might be three or four years old. At any rate, they're probably fully depreciated if they're, if they're getting ready to, to, to replace them. And unlike database servers where we can set up one big Oracle instance that might be physical and it can support 
dozens of applications, that space isn't like that, right? I mean, we normally support one or two business units, one or two functions, and, and that's kind of it. So there's really, it's harder for us to make a case to say I really need that to stay physical. Even if we lose performance going to it, it's harder to make that case. So why is performance so bad? Um, there's some simple answers. You know, this, uh, I see a lot of times IT will take where I have a 12-way or 24-way box on a physical server, and I get to the virtual platform, and now I've got eight cores. Oh, well, that's, that's probably a, a reduced number, and that, that can have an impact on performance. Memory. I, I had a lot of memory, and now I have less memory. Uh, and, and local storage, and now I don't. So local storage. Direct attached storage is always going to be faster than anything else. And, and we'll talk about why that is, especially as it relates to S-Space as we get a little, little bit further along. But keep that in mind as we go through this presentation. Because of the way that S-Space works and because of the way S-Space handles the, the, the storage subsystem, local attached storage will always outrun it. Crappy local attached storage will almost always outrun anything else. So some of the reasons are more complex. Sometimes your IT group has put you on a host that's just over-provisioned. You know, you, you're sharing boxes. And Alice said it depends on what box I'm on. Well, that might be a reason why. Either I'm on an older virtualized box that has a lot of servers on it, or I'm just on one that has too many things going on, and IT doesn't have the, the bandwidth to expand out and give me more. Um, and then finally, most storage subsystems that are, that are in a virtualized environment, they just don't play real nice with, with S-Base. And again, we'll, we'll get into why that is. So how do we fix this? Um, first, we have to identify the problem. You know, we, we'll look at processors, we'll look at memory, and then we'll look at storage. We can probably skip the first two and head straight to the third one because it's almost always storage. Um, but we don't just have to identify the problem. We also have to prove it to IT. How many times have you asked IT for something and their answer was, ah, it's probably just your application. You know, it's, it's not our server. I need, you to t I need you to do part of my job for me and tell me why it's slow. And, and I'm not talking to the S-based IT people in the room, Jeff. <laughs> I'm, talking to, I'm talking about infrastructure IT people. They need something that tells them what to go fix. And us just saying it's slow doesn't really help them. So we need to help them. So how do we identify those, those bottlenecks for them? And, and, and we can do a couple of things. First, we just need to look at our server and say, my old server had 16 cores, my new server has 16 cores. OK, check that box. If it doesn't, we probably need to have a conversation. Um, next, we need to look at the speed and generation of processors. So one of the things that happens when we go from physical to virtual my, my virtualized cluster runs, uh, it's a Xeon processor from five years ago. It's still as fast as most of my clients' processors because while the gigahertz have not really gone up over time, the efficiency has gone up. So, and really what virtualized hosts care about is how many cores can I stack together on this one little piece of silicon. So they don't care about processor speed. So a lot of virtualized boxes, you know, my processor operates at 2.6 gigahertz. Well, now I've upgraded to a virtualized processor that has twice as many cores, but they operate at 40% slower speed. Well, for S-Base, that's a problem. Because I don't know if you guys have noticed this yet, S-Base does not thread as great as you would want it to. It sounds, you can set Calc Parallel to, to 32 processors, you can set it up to 128 processors. Good luck getting it to do anything with anything past basically 16. And, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, and, and then over-provisioning is the other one. We talked about it earlier. The screenshot you see up there, if you think you have an over-provisioning issue, ask IT for this. Because what this is, this is a screenshot from, from VMware. And it basically says, here's the host I'm on. Here's what's on the host. Here's what's going on. Here's what my CPU utilization looks like. Here's my memory utilization. And here's my storage. If any of those are over in the red, and mine are all not in the red, but they will turn red when they get to the, far enough to the right, any of those are, are that far to the right, you, IT has a problem. And, and it's, it would be bad if they don't know that, but sometimes they don't. Same thing applies to memory, regardless of what the subtitle says. Um, and memory is, normally it's going to be how much memory do you have. And the, the speed and latency of memory is not nearly as important to S-Base as some of the other bottlenecks, because at the end of the day, S-Base is going to be bottlenecked by 99% of the time by one or two things. It's either going to be your processors if you don't have enough, or if you don't have enough disk I.O. to support that many processors. And again, over-provisioning is going to be kind of the exception to that. If you have a, a host that is over-provisioned on memory, which is something that is very easy to do, then you can suddenly start to page to disk because everything's trying to use all of the physical memory, and now everything gets really slow. You will not be the only one that's affected by things like this, but a lot of times other applications don't care that much. S-Base does. You know, S-Base cares a lot about, uh, about things like memory I.O., disk I.O., and CPU. 
Um, we actually had a client that had this happen. Um, they, they, one day, all of their loads went from taking 10 minutes to taking two and a half hours. And, and they had no explanation, and IT said nothing had changed until they looked at this and said, oh, okay, I guess we need to add some resources. So our final piece, and what's almost always the problem, is storage. So why is there a high probability of this? Many of the SBA servers that you're gonna go from, especially a physical server, is gonna be direct attached storage. Now that means direct attached storage has a lot less latency because it's in the box, right? There's less, there's less copper for it to go across to get from A to Z. Um, it's also common that a lot of that direct attached storage, even from as much as five years ago, might be solid state instead of hard drive. So why does that matter? Um, well, it matters because SBase is, is really sensitive to three things when it comes to, I, to storage. It's sensitive to random read and write performance. It's sensitive to latency, which directly impacts read and write performance on a random basis. And it's sensitive to sequential read and write. Now the sequential read and write, it's not really that important because pretty much any kind of a RAID array when it comes to hard drive, solid state, whatever, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna be plenty fast for S-Base, but the random read and random write performance is gonna be the biggest hit. So many, many virtualized environments run on what we call a clustered file system. So who knows what a clustered file system or a block file system is? Anybody? Okay, so a, a block storage system is intended for one host and another host and another host to all access the same file system. So to provide high availability, if I have three virtual servers, they need to all have access to the same storage at the same time. That's a block storage system, a clustered file system. So those are really beneficial for high availability and backups and all the, all the stuff that IT likes them for, but it adds a lot of latency because now we have another hop to get to. So now it's going over the network to get to network storage and then it has to do its thing and come back. And we'll get a little deeper into that a little later too. Another issue we have is high queue depths are generally the only way to get really good random performance out of a lot of different storage things. So what is, what is queue depth? Queue depth is essentially, when we look at hard drives, hard drives process information just like we do. They, they, they take it all in and then they spit it back out. Well, if I have something and then I'm processing it and then I have to wait for the next thing and then wait for the next thing and it's not just they're waiting for me, then I'm eventually going to get a backlog, right? I have a bottleneck because I don't have something pushing information to me enough, fast enough that I can spit it back out to you in a, in a good manner. Well, when we look at all the different statistics that come across on our storage, random reads and writes and, and sequential speeds, all of those things are generally done at very high queue depths. So if I say I can get a million IOs out of my SAN, that's awesome. How, what's your queue depth? Because SBase can only operate at one queue depth, one. S-Base can only do one queue depth, which kind of sucks because a lot of the modern technology, the whole reason that it, it, it is so fast is because it's, a, it's on something that has the ability to process parallel information, a lot of information at once. And S-Base is not giving it to it fast enough. So it creates a bottleneck even if we have really fast storage because S-Base can't address it fast enough. And this is one of the big, one of the big detriments to the way that I.O. is done inside of S-Base. So when your IT tells you we have the fastest SAN available, it doesn't matter because the latency is still there that slows down the random read and write performance. And we'll see that when we get to the ben benchmarks. Um, and, and at the end of the day, all the things that it's fast at, S-Base doesn't care about. S-Base cares about how fast can I do one Q depth worth, worth of information and how quickly can it process that. So if, you were, so if you were gonna go try and identify the issue on your own servers, I would recommend getting a couple of benchmarking tools. So Crystal Diskmark is one that's really popular out there. How many of you have run Crystal Diskmark on your own server before? I know you have, Jeff. So, so this is what it looks like, and, and there's four pieces that it's, gonna, that it's gonna run. It's gonna do a sequential at a Q depth of 32, which is a very high Q depth. It's gonna do a 4K, which is random, um, at, a, at a Q depth of 32, then it's gonna do a sequential and a 4K at, at a Q depth of one. So when we look at these numbers, that bottom one is the one that means the most to us. So when we look at a locally attached piece of storage, so P3605 is one of the newer types of storage. It's, it's NVMe. It basically takes all of the latency out of your system and attaches storage directly to your CPU, which is something that's pretty cool. Um, so that low latency means we can get much better response on our random reads and writes. So if you look at the very bottom, those 4K reads and writes, those are really high numbers. It doesn't seem like it, but those are really high numbers. Now you look on the right, that's the same physical piece of storage, the same device, 
but it's connected a different way. It's connected through iSCSI, which goes across a network. So now I have network latency. It's connecting to a server th that, is, that it is attached to, which has an additional layer of latency. And it also has all kinds of issues around drivers and firmware and all kinds of things that can impact this. So we've taken something simple that's locally attached that gets really good performance, and we've added all of the layers of latency in between it. So what, what could be really fast if it was locally attached, you'll see is about a tenth as fast when it's connected via the network. And this is pretty consistent performance readings. So we, we, can, we can run the same test on, on most SANs and get pretty close to those same numbers. And you, the, the thing you'll notice though, if you look up at the Q depth on the 4K Q32, those are really high numbers. That, that would be great if S-Space could actually do that. And those are the numbers that IT is talking about when they say our SAN is fast. It is fast, it's just not fast for S-Space. So other things that you can look out for to know if you have a storage problem versus CPU or memory, look at your CPU utilization. If you're running a calc parallel calc and it's using one of the eight cores that you've asked it to, you probably have an I.O. issue. And then that can take you down the path of, okay, let's go just look at it. Go look in, go look in task manager and see how much of your I.O. is actually going across. What you're probably gonna find is that your disk I.O. is really slow. It's gonna be one or three or five meg a second and, and a lot of people think it's just gonna be two or 300 megasecond because I have a fast drive, right? I have a solid state drive, it should be quick. Well, unfortunately, S-Space doesn't work quite that way. So how do we prove this out? How do we tell IT that something is slow and that we need to fix it? So option number one, you can test your application on your old hardware and compare it to the new virtualized platform. That's a great option and you should start there. The problem is those two things are completely dissimilar. You have one that's a, physically att a physical system with a set of characteristics, maybe older hardware and a lot of things, and you have a new one that might be connected to clustered file system and all the other things that go along with being a, on a virtualized platform. So that, that test isn't gonna mean a lot because you're comparing apples to oranges. You're apples to bananas, they're not even both round. Um, and then option two, you can have an independent party come in like a me and say, you know what, I can benchmark your system both ways. I can do that, I have a, I have a benchmark lab. I have the, the facility for me to take your application and say here's what it looks like on a physical system, here's what it looks like on an exactly matching virtual system and compare that to your performance to know if it's something going on with your configuration. That costs you money. And, and as much as I would love to come do that for all of you, I bet you don't wanna pay for me to do that for all of you. So the last option is what if we had a, a standardized benchmark application that we could actually compare to, right? So I, I run it on my system, you run it on your system, we compare. That would be great, right, if something like that existed. You would think that something like that would exist. Um, and once upon a time, Hyperion actually had standardized applications that they provided, but those are long since passed. And frankly, the size metrics on those are so much different than they are on, on what we do today. We need something big enough that will really stress out a system, but, but not take too long to run. Um, and, and nothing really helps IT more than having something that they can compare to someone else. Because if you show IT and you say, hey, I ran this benchmark and I compared it to another system that looks just like ours, why is yours so much slower? That's a place for them to start. That's more information. The more, the more information we give IT, the better they're gonna be able to help us if they can. So what is S-Bench? First, it has an awesome logo, right? I did not make that logo. Uh, so S-Bench is a BSO application. It's actually a planning application that deploys into just a regular old BSO cube. Um, that BSO cube is pretty big, so it has a thousand, uh, a thousand accounts, a bunch of sparse non-aggregating dimensions that don't matter as much, and then it has two pretty hefty sparse dimensions that aggregate, so around 8,000 to 9,000 members apiece. It also has a lot of data in it. Um, so we've got about 10 million rows of data that we load four times. So there's roughly 40 million rows worth of data that are going into the system. It end up, ends up generating roughly around 10 gig of page and index files when you get done running the whole thing. So you need a little bit of disk space. So what does this benchmark do? So it's, it's a PowerShell script. If somebody wants to convert this for Unix people, be my guest. Um, but Windows is what most of my clients run anyway. I only have one out of probably 100 that run on, on Unix right now. Um, but it's a set of PowerShell scripts that creates a log file and executes a maxl command. So that maxl command goes through several steps to try and test things that you would do in your everyday S-space life. So first it, it clears the data in the cube. That's just to make sure we start from scratch. Then it's gonna load data using, using a native S-space file. Then it's gonna aggregate the cube, then it's gonna execute an allocation, it's gonna aggregate the cube again, then it's gonna execute a currency conversion and restructure the database. So I tried to hit check all the boxes of all the different things you would want your system to do to test the different types of performance. 
then it executes all of those steps three times so that we can get an average and see, see how well it works. In an ideal world, we could run this five times, drop the high, drop the low, and average the three, but I don't have that kind of time, so we went with three. So what are we benchmarking on? Uh, so I have a benchmark lab that I've set up, much to my wife's chagrin, um, that has two eight core processors, so 16 physical cores, um, 32 logical threads, 128 gig of RAM, and then a bunch of different storage options. So we've got a single solid state disk attached, we've got four solid state disk, disks in RAID 0, we've got 12 um, regular spinning hard drives um, in RAID 1 plus 0, and we've got a, a single NVMe drive. So NVMe again is that, it's the newer SSD technology that's basically directly attached to your CPU. Uh, and then finally we have network attached storage. So what's not on here is I also, much to my wife's chagrin again, built a SAN at home. That, that will facilitate all of this testing so that we can get pretty close to enterprise performance out of a, out of, out of a SAN for benchmark purposes without having to go to EMC and drop off a, a lot of money. So where does this run? I keep it in my garage, just like all of you keep your servers in your garage, right? No? Okay. Yes, okay, also I am still married, I promise, she's still there. I, I don't know how. So let's look at the benchmarks. So the first thing I wanted to see was if we just take the fastest possible configuration and we compare it, how fast is physical versus virtual on the exact same hardware with the exact same devices? So same hard drive, same CPU, same memory, the three things that matter. What's the difference in speed? So the difference in speed is not great. It's, it's about a 21% ding just going from physical to virtual in this configuration. Obviously there are a lot of factors that play into all of those things, drivers and, and firmwares and all kinds of stuff, but that's a pretty good benchmark that tells us kind of where we could be going from physical to virtual. Now the benefit here is as you go from physical to virtual, you guys will hopefully be going from new, older technology to newer technology. So some of this will be able to offset. And if you're going from older technology to newer technology and your IT has, has put together a really good virtualized environment, you can still get pretty good performance. So it doesn't have to be earth shatteringly bad, that, which is what it normally ends up being, unfortunately. So another thing that I wanna talk about before we get into the more detailed benchmarks, um, it's always been kind of commonly held that if you're on a virtual machine, you have to thickly provision your storage, right? Do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say thick, thin, and, and lazy, and eager, and all those different words? Okay, so thin, thinly provisioned disks basically only take up the amount of space on a disk that the, uh, that the space is being asked for. So it, it's called a high watermark. So it expands and expands and expands, but it never gives it back. So if you do one giant sequential write to your disk, it takes all of that space on the disk and doesn't ever give it back. So now I have this space of disks to work with in my thin provisioning. Thick, lazy and, uh, lazy and eager thick provisioning basically pre-allocate all of the space for your drive. So for me, working at home, I do thin provisioned every time because I only have so much disk space and I want to do so many different things that I'll run out of disk space if I do thick provisioning in like a week because I like to do a lot of testing, obviously. And, and that's a problem. So I heard that, you know, I've, I've heard this commonly, commonly held belief. We, we, we have to run thick provisioning or performance isn't good. Well, then I started reviewing the documentation just in ESX, which is the VMware server that you're probably running on if you're virtualized. And if you look in the documentation, it actually says that performance between the two should be virtually the same. So there will be very little difference between them. So I said, okay, well, I gotta test it. Um, why, why do I have a test bed if I can't test stuff like this? So I took my fastest hardware and I said, okay, I'm gonna create a thin provision disk, a thick provision disk, and a thick provision disk. So they're both kinds of thick provisioning. And I ran all of my benchmarks three times each and compared. And what I saw was that there's virtually no difference, which is exactly what the documentation says should be true. So that's good. But this is different than what we've always heard, right? We've always, I, if, you've, if you've been around infrastructure guys, they always say do a thick provision disk, that's probably the problem. It might not be the problem. So that's interesting. Now, having said that, if you can get a thick provision disk, I'd go for it, because why not? I, I think the biggest reason is, back in the day when everything was on hard drives and random performance on hard drives is awful, because it has to go around a spinning disk and find things, I think now with SSD technology, it just doesn't matter that much. Random performance is fast enough, a, an SSD does not have to seek to find something on a disk, it knows where it is. So when you look at, at, at a, a continuum on an SSD, it's just plucking it out of air wherever it thinks it is, and I think that's really the reason that we don't see any difference between those two, three. 
All right, so let's get into, before I keep going, because I know I, I'm just talking and talking, any questions so far? I'm doing that great of a job of explaining this? I doubt that. Okay. Yes? So, so the, the question is, the, the commonly held belief is that you need to, to separate out your log file and your, and your page file and all, that, uh, and all that stuff. You know, frankly, in my testing, I didn't test that particular thing, but a lot of that is old school because we, we were only able to do so much, with, again, we had hard drives that only had so much performance. So we look for ways to get SBase to go after better performance. SSDs have kind of knocked all that stuff down. Um, and, and part of the point of this presentation is to kind of kind of reset expectations around what, what should we expect out of our hardware? What should it be like? Because if I can get good performance, why make it harder on myself? Yes? Well, and that's a good point. So her comment is it would, it would only be if, if you were on a separate I.O. channel because a lot of times, especially if you're doing iSCSI or something like that where your network attached, you're sharing the same network pipeline. So if, even though you split them off, it may not matter. I, I, I had a client that had a very large ASO cube and, and we had one HBA, so that's, that's the host bus adapter that connects the system to a network attached storage in this instance. And they had one and it had crappy throughput and everything was the bottleneck because of it. So it doesn't matter how much we do if, if, if we're still sharing the same, IT, same, same piece of the same highway, right? So let's look at the individual performance and kind of kind of evaluate what is it that SBase is doing because what we can we can actually glean a lot from these benchmarks to kind of see what things affect SBase because one of the things that matters is what you do with SBase. A lot of you, all you care about is I load data and I aggregate it. Some of you care about I load data and I allocate it. Some of you care about I load data and and that's it and I'm done. I don't even necessarily need to allocate it depending on if it's especially we don't have ASO today but we will we will get there. So let's start with an SBase native load. So an SBase native load should be automatically ordered by the sparse dimensions so that it creates a sequential write back to disk. What that means is the sequential write performance of your drives, this is the only time it will ever matter. One of the only times it will ever matter. So what you'll see on the, on the benchmark is across the board, we're pretty good until we get to the old school hard drives. It goes pretty fast. It doesn't really matter all that much between those. Um, you know, there, there are obviously differences between them, but in general, everything is pretty quick no matter what I select. Now let's look at a load rule. So load rules are not like a native file. So a native file, I, I said, kind of forced you into doing a sequential write to disk. Well, a load rule file, especially if you already have data in the cube, has to go figure out every block that it's gonna touch and every block that needs to get updated and then recalculate everything. So when, when you're doing a load, just a basic load rule, it ends up taking a ton of random I.O. to do so. And you can see it because as you go across, we start, over, we start with our NVMe device, which is our fastest device. We go to RAID SSDs and then we go to a single SSD. And by the time we get to network storage where performance starts to suffer on random I.O., that's when you start seeing the numbers go up. And, and I couldn't even get the last one to run. I'm still not sure why. Um, so what about an aggregation? So aggregations are, are a little bit different. Um, they still do a fair amount of random I.O., but not as much because they're still writing to disk sequentially. So they have to read a certain amount randomly, but they're writing it sequentially. So your bottleneck is going to be on the read side. Um, and again, random reads and the, the way that things read on an SSD, you can tell things are plenty fast on any SSD, even across iSCSI. So even across a network, this is plenty fast. Where we see that we have a lot of performance challenges is on, on the old school hard drive methodology. How many of you are, do, if you know, how many of you are on hard drives versus SSDs? Hard drives? No one? All SSDs? SSDs? I know you're on, how many of you don't know? All right, we're gonna figure that out. Because I, I, if you're having a, yes? Well, all of our systems have SSDs in front, which will take that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that is an excellent question. So if you look at the, the, uh, the, the last two before hard drive there, the one on the left, iSCSI NVMe, is just a, it is an iSCSI drive that is directly attached to 
a, 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 a very fast SSD. Um, the one next to it is actually eight hard drives in RAID 1 plus 0 with an SSD cache in front of it. As long as you don't exceed the cache, you get a pretty darn good ratio of performance. Now there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, when you're doing either cache on a virtual server or cache on, on a, on a network-based storage device, the, there's something called hit cache ratio, which basically says how much of what I'm looking for is actually cached, and when things aren't cached, performance will suffer. So uh, this is a little bit skewed because there's nothing else going on on my server, so everything's cached. Um, so it skews it a little bit. Uh, having said that, a lot of times on the S-Space front, if you're doing operations after you do something, so I just wrote it to disk and now I'm actually doing an ag on it, you'll, you'll experience the same thing because as long as the cache is big enough to fit all of that in and there aren't too many other operations going on on the server, it's gonna stay in cache. So it'll be okay. Um, but yeah, cache makes a massive difference. So if you can't get all SSD, at least having SSDs in front of an H, uh, a hard drive setup makes a big difference and, and it makes it very fast. Okay, so let's look at an allocation. Um, when you do a fixed parallel, it doesn't work like a calc parallel. So a fixed parallel forces it to, to basically thread on whatever we've given it. So I gave it, um, I gave it a single sparse dimension, a big one, and told it to thread across eight threads. Well, what that forced it into was doing a bunch of sequential performance. We know that because nothing on here is slow. If anything on here was slow, we would know that there was random performance going on. So we can draw a lot of conclusions just looking at, at things like these basic benchmarks. So what about a targeted allocation or aggregation? So unlike a regular aggregation that just basically reads from disk and then writes a big, big amount of data to disk, when you re-aggregate something that's already aggregated, I now have to read, modify, and commit things back to disk. That's a lot of random I.O. And how do we know that? because if we look at our hard drive performance, it skews the results so much that we can't even tell how everything else is. So let's take it off. So if you take hard drives off because they're slow, um, then you'll see, you can kind of see the difference between here's the NVMe drive, here's the SSDs, and, and you can see where things get fast and things get slow. And again, we'll see consistently that our iSCSI device, our network attached storage is consistently slower than local attached storage even though they share the same basic hardware configuration. So what about a currency conversion? So for currency conversion, if we go through and, and run the same benchmarks, we'll see the same basic premise. It's having to do a lot of random I.O. to get there. And again, we see our hard drive numbers skewing everything by a pretty large amount. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna let you guys go through this on your own and kind of look at it, because I, I only have so much time today, so I apologize if I'm going really fast. So if there's something specific you want me to describe or slow down, let me know. So this is it without the hard drives. So without the hard drives, you can kind of see, okay, when we get to iSCSI, things again slow down a pretty good amount. So what about a restructure? Restructures are interesting. So if you're on a, a version before, I think 11.1.2.3, you don't have the option to do restructure threads. And that is not a good thing because that means your restructure in a BSO cube is single threaded. So it probably takes a fair amount of time. It takes so much time that most clients will clear out the, uh, export the data, clear out the data, and re-import the data. Well, with restructure threads set to 16 in this instance, we don't have to do that. We can just restructure the data in place. And the cool part about it is, it, all it does is take everything and read it and write it back out. So it's all sequential reads and sequential writes, so it really doesn't matter. Even our hard drives can do this fast. Um, so, and there's not a whole lot of difference between them. Our local attached hard drives are almost as fast as all of our solid state options for this particular operation. So that's very interesting. Because what this means is restructure threads as we do an upgrade, will give us an opportunity to improve performance without needing IT's help. So we'll keep that in mind as we, as we keep going. So let's look at just the total time to do all of these things. And you can kind of see who wins, who wins the overall race. So the NVMe is still gonna be the fastest, direct attached stuff. Um, but iSCSI is not terrible. Uh, and, and the hard drives were left off of this one because, well, actually I've got an extra slide. There we go. Um, and we, le we left the hard drives off because they, they skew results so much. So if we take all of that that we just looked at, you can see it in one giant graph that's really hard to read from way back there. So I'll let you guys review this on your own time, but that's kind of a, a look at everything that was tested across the board, across all the different storage options. So you can kind of see where the, peaks, where, where the spikes are. They're, they're mostly on network storage and hard drives. So what if I have, how many of you have more than one S-based application? Exactly, and that's a good thing. 
because one of the one of the one of the things we've talked about a lot so far is that SPACE is not very good at, at using the full capacity of a disk drive, right? So we have the super fast SSD, but it only uses a fraction of the capabilities of that SSD. Well, if we have two applications doing the same thing in the same time frame, we are automatically in doubling our queue depth. So what happens when we do that? Well, if we look at the performance numbers, what you're seeing, the first two columns are individual runs. So SBench 12 and 13 are separate applications on the same, on the same, uh, on the same storage array. Then the second two columns are if we execute the first two columns at the same time in parallel. So what we're doing is we're doubling our queue depth and getting SBase to take advantage of more of our application, uh, of more of our disk I.O. And if you'll notice, if you look at the graph, you don't, there's not a whole lot of performance penalty here. Um, and most of the performance penalty that you see is, is really just the overhead of SBase having multiple threads that it's, that it's managing. So if you want to increase performance and, and you don't have a way to change your disk, you only have so much you can do, one thing you can do is split your app into two apps and maybe do a partition. So just an option to try and get you away from being completely reliant on, on something that IT wants you to do. Or if you have multiple applications, execute the, those things in parallel so that you're not waiting for one to execute and then the other to execute. And then since a lot of you are on, an, on, on network attached storage, the other cool part about this is network attached storage, we, we talked about earlier, SANs are really fast. IT says they're fast. They are fast. They can handle this because if I go up, same thing. First two columns are executed in series, so one at a time. The second, the third and fourth column are the first two columns executed together. There's barely any performance penalty there. So I can do both of the applications at the same time in the amount of time it takes to do one application individually. That's a huge benefit. That's a great way we can figure out to use what we have. So if we can't get something better, at least let's take it full advantage of what, of what IT is giving us. Does this make sense? Am I explaining it right? Okay. So let's talk about network attached storage and why it's slow. So iSCSI is one of the, one of the favorite ones. So iSCSI is essentially a SCSI interface over a network connection. Um, and, and that's an oversimplification of what's going on. Um, but iSCSI has a lot of different overhead and it has even more overhead on a virtualized environment. So let's look at direct attached storage versus um, versus a, a file-based system. So if we look at physical, you see we have a server and that server has a hard drive. There's, there's your latency right there. It's just how long does it take for that to happen. Okay, now if we have a virtual device, we have a server that connects to, a, that's part of a virtual server that connects to a hard drive. So now we have extra latency. Now it's not gonna slow us down double, but we have extra latency that's gonna slow us down. Now let's look at iSCSI. We have a physical server connected to another server that is connected to a hard drive. So we're increasing another layer of latency and it's even worse for, for a virtual system. So we have a virtual, a virtual machine connected to a server, that server is connected to another server and that server is finally connected to the hard drive. So we're just increasing our latency over time. So this is why network based storage struggles because latency drives the performance of random IO. So it, it is directly correlated. So as latency goes up, random IO goes down because random IO is dependent on the completion of the first IO before it starts the second IO. So if you're gonna get to 1500 IOs per second, you have to complete 1500 IOs in a, in a row and each of them has to wait to finish. So the higher latency is, the longer it takes for each one of those to complete, the longer it takes to do those 1500 IOs. So now that we've gone through all of that and we only have like five minutes left or, or so, how do we fix all of this? Um, and First, it's take all of the information you can to IT. Run a benchmark application and compare it to other people. Check out your disks, ask for information, and, and then you can start asking for things like, hey, I need more processors if that's what I'm low on. I need more memory. I need faster hard drives. Ask for direct attached storage. I can't tell you the number of IT groups that I've talked to where they go, I mean, we normally do iSCSI, we normally do network storage, but if that's what you need, we can make it happen. You just have to ask and then provide them with the budget to do it. And since a lot of you are FP&A, that shouldn't be hard, right? You can find it. Yes. What's that, 20 minutes? Oh, cool. So how do we fix the problem without IT? So if you're going virtual, you're hopefully also upgrading. So like if you're going from 11.1.2.1, you have some new options when you get to 11.1.2.3 or 11.1.2.4. You have restructure threads. So restructure threads is great because again, as we talked about earlier, it, it does everything sequentially. 
So even if I have really crappy hard drives, really crappy subsystem on the disk side, I can still get a pretty sizable increase in performance because the difference between extracting my data, importing my data, and aggregating my data, there's, there's a lot of random I.O. that's gonna eventually happen during the aggregation itself. This cuts down on that. So you can do a lot, even with crappy I.O., with restructure threads. The other thing is fixed parallel. Fixed parallel forces it to read a sparse dimension sequentially so it speeds up performance. So you can use fixed parallel. You can take, take something that you had calc parallel eight, rewrite your calc script to use fixed parallel, and you're gonna get performance increases of a pretty good magnitude. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that you'll have calculations that are running single threaded anyway. So, uh, and how many of you have looked at your calc script logs and noticed that it, it, you do something that throws it into single threaded mode? Yeah, and when that happens, it goes really slow, doesn't it? Well, before we didn't really have an option. I mean, if we threw it into single threaded mode, we can't pull it out of single threaded mode. It's doing something that causes S space to not be able to break out of that, right? Well, there's your option. Fixed parallel will allow you to take that single threaded operation and break it apart and, and thread it across a, a sparse dimension, which is pretty cool. Um, and you can do it a variety of ways. The biggest thing on fixed parallel is try and do it with as dense a dimension as you can so that you can do something like currency. Currency is going to be pretty dense for, for a lot of things. So if you have eight currencies and you have eight threads, great. Go thread eight currencies across eight threads. Yes. Now, so ASO is a little bit of a different animal. Um, Calc Parallel works great on ASO. It works completely differently. So in, when you look at BSO, fixed par uh, Calc Parallel is actually really, really inefficient in general. So if you tell it, I need eight processors and I have eight processors, and you go look at your usage, you're probably using like 60 or 70% most of the time. And, and there's a couple of reasons why. Part of it's gonna be your IO subsystem is slowing down. Part of it is just gonna be that S-Space isn't all that great at, at doing it because it, it, it does the best math that it can to figure out the best way to parallelize it, but it only does so well. Um, on, on ASO, it's a little bit different because obviously we have a lot of different ways to parallelize things. So S-Space, on BSO, when we wanna do a parallel data load, we have to have the same text file format to load in parallel. In ASO, I can just tell it execute 20 different SQL queries and do them all at the same time and it will completely parallelize that and, and get a really good amount of performance increase if you can have the I.O. to keep up with it. Um, calc parallel though, for things like, basically all you're talking about is at that point materializing aggregations, right? Because I, I guess in theory you could also be talking about doing an allocation, but those are, are not all that used on the ASO side. Okay. So, got it. So if you're using allocations and things like that, then cal par fixed parallel won't affect you because it is a CalScript only thing. Now what I will tell you is, if you haven't already seen it, I know Cameron's posted on it, I know um, a couple other people have posted on it, and you may already be using it, but there, there, is a, there is an ASO command you can run that will basically eliminate empty blocks, or empty, uh, it excludes missing intersections from the calculation. Yes, that. So if you're, if you're already using that, that'll make a massive performance improvement, but it still won't fix all the world's problems. Similar, but different. And, and, and so the question is, does it work the same way it does in block storage? So if you look at block storage, block storage has two components, page file and the index file. So you've got the block, and you've got the sparse intersections. So all of that's getting written to disk, and you can theoretically split it apart and, and do things like that, but it, it only helps so much. Um, if you look at ASO, ASO similarly has a temp file, which is not, not exactly the same, but in, in a similar fashion, it has a temp area, and it has a final area. And what you can do is you can split those apart, and if they're on different IOs, you can get an increase in performance. So if you're not already doing that, consider going down that path because what it will do is it will relieve some of the pressure on the reads that are occurring at the same time as the writes, and especially on network storage, that can be an issue. Um, and, and yeah, definitely consider looking at splitting those two things out. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you're gonna see that a lot. I mean, when, when your storage, at the end of the day, when we look at all of this, our goal is to do as much as we can in memory because disk IO is always gonna slow you down. So the more you can fit into memory and the more you can calculate before you commit it back to disk, the better off you're gonna be. And in ASO, we only have so much control over that. And you, you do have the cache sizes that will allow you to do a fair amount of that. I, the last time I, well, and let me, let me, let me caveat that. I, I, I took an application that had about seven terabytes of data in it. And that application took roughly seven hours to, to materialize aggregations on, just doing cache settings and, and changing the way the IO worked around the temp file and the, and the, the dat file. We were able to get that down below three hours, just with cache settings, basically. Well, well and, and one of the things, again, I think it, it, it providing IT with more information, if you can give them, if you can give them an example of the performance you're gonna get out of it, then that might help. The other, the other issue that we run into, and I have this issue at that same client, we ask them, well, what does it take to get us more performance? Well, we have to upgrade our SAM. Well, what does that cost? A million dollars. Okay, well, this might not be that big of a problem. So, <laughs> so that's, that's what we, we kind of have to go through and, and find out, okay, what can I do, IT do for me? Which is a great segue. So IT can only do so much, right? They're IT. Um, and, and they do, in, in most instances, they do a great job to try and support us as best they can. But they have a finite number of resources, they have a finite amount of hardware, and, and sometimes you're fighting a losing battle in a turf war if you're unfortunate enough to be in one of those. So what do you do if that's the case, and, and IT really can't or won't help you? So let's check out the cloud. Um, so let's, let's kind of look at the cloud leader, and, and I know I'm in an Oracle conference, so it'll probably be bad to say this, but so let's look at Amazon, because Amazon leads the world at cloud, by far, by far. So Amazon recently released, back in February, their new i3 series of servers with NVMe storage. So it's got really fast processors, and I don't know if you guys can read that, hopefully you can read it when, if and when you download it, but it has a custom processor designed by Intel for Amazon that operates at a pretty good clip, so it's not, it's not just about threads, it also has a pretty good speed to it has 244 gig of RAM, it can, it, can, it, it can get smaller, but it also has, it has over eight terabytes of NVMe storage. So this is pretty quick, but can it keep up with what we're gonna do? So before we get to that, Amazon has the i3 series, um, and it's, it, it, you'll see in a minute, it's pretty awesome. Um, Microsoft also has their Azure Cloud, and on there there's the L series server that has direct attached SSDs. So they've taken the latency out and, and tried to give us faster performance. Google has database tuned servers that also have direct attached SSDs. And Oracle has their dense IO series, which also has NVMe storage. So we have four really good options out there that IT doesn't have to be involved in too much. Um, one thing to watch out for when you're looking at cloud-based options, we talked about it early, clustered file systems or block storage. Um, if they're using block storage, it's probably gonna suffer on S-Space. S-Space doesn't like block storage, it doesn't like the latency. So if you can get away from that, great. And then from an IT perspective, it's someone else's problem that we have direct attached storage. Um, so we see all these options. How does it compare to a physical box or even to a virtual box? So what I did was I took my fastest physical configuration and, and I had a client that asked me this question two weeks ago. Very, very convenient timing for me. Um, and I said, you know what, let's try out this new Amazon server. So they did. They said, okay, we're gonna buy an i3. So they have an i3 instance, it's got 32 cores, it's, or 32 vCPUs, it's got 244 gig of RAM, and all the NVMe storage you, could, you can eat. So if you compare, if you look at the numbers down there, you will see that it is not only, it is not only as fast, it is actually faster than my physically attached fastest configuration that I have. That's pretty awesome. And that's very encouraging, because it means we do have another option, and it doesn't have to be, we don't have to be held hostage by whatever it is that IT decides. You know, we can do something else, as long as we, we get IT's approval and support, we have options out there. Jeff, you might find this one interesting. So, I also had an opportunity to take one of my, uh, one of my other clients that has a, a really fast server. So, I'm, I'm not gonna name the company who provided the server, but they make the processors that are in the servers. And so they have pretty good hardware. And, and their hardware is by far faster than mine, like by far. I mean, th this server has 
88, 88 logical cores with 256 gig of RAM, but it's connected to a SAN. <laughs> and it's an EM, EMC Symmetrics box, which is a good box, it's not slow, but if you compare, you'll notice it's not fast either. So if you compare it to a locally attached uh, system, and th this is a physical box, it's not virtual. So this is a physical versus physical versus physical. We've got my physical box, which is NVMe storage, my physical box connected to network storage, and then the client's connected to SAN. And it's kind of in between. You know, it's, it's more toward the slow, slow SAN like mine. But hey, I actually feel pretty good that my, my local SAN can get pretty close to their really expensive EMC box. So I feel pretty good about that. So this next slide, I'm gonna need all of you to forget that you saw this slide after you leave the room, and if anybody from Oracle is here, cover your eyes or something. So how does, how does PBCS compare? Anybody wonder? How many of you are considering or already have PBCS? One, wow, you guys all like S-Base, man, on-prem. The answer is it does not compare well. So as we go left to right, the first bar is a physical box, the fastest configuration just to compare. The second box is a virtual box connected to network storage. The third box is a virtual box connected to just regular hard drives with no SSDs attached. And the fourth box is PBCS. And what you will notice is PBCS closely resembles a box configured with just regular hard drives. And that's disappointing. Um, and, and I don't know how long it'll be like this. And again, this is just my pod that I have access to. We tried it on the production instance and the test instance. The test instance was actually way, way slower. Um, so an interesting thing to note as you're considering a transition to PBCS, you may wanna get somebody to test your application for you performance-wise, because those numbers don't paint a great picture. So before I get to Q&A, I have to thank some people. Some of them are in the room because they had other obligations. Well, obviously my wife has other obligations because our kids are at home. Um, and she's watching them for me while I'm out of town. Um, my company has actually supported me a lot throughout this process and helped provide some of the hardware for my benchmarking system. And then some of the people, uh, Jake Turrell and, and Tim German have been awesome at helping me understand better at how S-Base works and things that people might wanna see as we build this S-Bench application. And I'm hoping all of you will try the S-Base application just to see how you stack up. One of the things I wanna do is get a database that has where you can go and compare how, to, how does your performance compare to others, because I think that will be beneficial for everybody. Um, and then also my clients that are patient enough to let me go use their fun hardware to play with um, for things like this. So I really appreciate that. And then a shameless plug. So my blog, the sbench.com, uh, and then be sure to use the, the Twitter hashtag Oracle EPM. Questions? Yes? So the question is, these are all results on the back end. I haven't seen anything on the front end. That is a fair point and it is on my very long list of things to do. I will get to it. I just haven't yet. I've actually worked with a company, Excelitus, they're a sponsor, um, and they've, they were kind enough to provide me with the software, so I'm actually going to take all of the stuff that you're looking at here and provide performance metrics on how all of these things stack up when you have users hitting it. So that's coming, I just didn't have time to get it done before this presentation. Also, I didn't have enough time to fit it into this presentation. <laughs> all right, other questions? Yes. So the question is, if you're having problems with the SAN, what are your recommendations for tuning? Um, it depends, and, and there's a lot of different things you can try. It depends on the SAN. Um, one thing you can look at is jumbo frames, um, because that can, in, in a lot of cases it makes no difference, but in some cases it can make a 20 or 30 percent difference. It really depends on both the SAN and the hardware that's connecting to it. So it depends. Um, you can also work with whoever your SAN provider is and see if there are things like, can you provide me with an SSD cache if I don't already have one? Can you change me over to another set of LUNs that are, that are SSD only? You know, do you have an IO based performance? Can you give me an extra HBA? You know, can I have two different disks on two different channels? So there are things you can do without having to purchase a lot of extra stuff out of your SAN. Um, 
So I would go that route, and if if you need any help with that, you know where to find me. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get a dedicated SAN for S space, why wouldn't you just do direct attached storage? Um, you know, SANs are there because you're going to be sharing it with everybody else. I think the key is to find find a place on that hardware where you can be as dedicated as you can, which is going to be, you know, if you're on iSCSI, it's can I get my own port? Um, if you're on a fiber channel, can I get my own HBA? Or can I get two HBAs? You know, things like that. Yes? Say that one more time. It, more than 16 cores. So what I've found, and, and most of this is a function of how it addresses the I.O. subsystem, because honestly it's hard to find a disk that it, at a Q depth of one will actually perform fast enough to go beyond really not much more beyond eight threads. Like if you look at the performance difference between eight threads and 16 threads, it's not all that earth shatteringly different. Um, because S space can only do so much with the I.O. that it has to work with. Other questions? All right, guys.